So hello everyone, my name is Dora. I'm one of the organizers of Kesher. And you can also find here Sebastian. We started this project four years ago, and I know that many of you have been to many events. So thank you for uh, always listening to us and being here. And if you're joining us for the first time also, we are very glad that you could make it today. Um, so what we normally do is introducing Jewish communities from all over the world. So we have sessions in which we learn about history, Jewish heritage, Jewish culture, and also present day situation of, of Jewish communities in different places, countries, continents. And from this uh, grew our second series, uh, which is introducing Jewish themed books. And this is the event, the type of event that we will have today, as we realize that so many people have written amazing family stories, amazing um different approach in different approaches sharing something very very similar but but in a book so we learn about Jewish communities through books in these presentations so today we are very glad to welcome Catherine Fanelli who is an immigration policy expert whose work has taken her to many of the countries where her late grandfather lived out his adventures so you, if you read the description, you know that this book is it's called Family Declassified. And uh, she explores how his grandfather who was originally a Hungarian Jew, went into amazing adventures or amazing uh, different roles in his life. And, uh, and he, she used her expertise as a researcher to learn about her own family, which is also very interesting. And I know that many of you or many people today try to look into where their family comes from and what their family did. So I think also from that point of view, this, this book and this research is, is super relevant um, for us. So I'm, I'm going to pass the words to, to Catherine. She's going to present about her book. And after her presentation, we will have time for comments, questions, answers. So you can write them in the chat and we will read them at the end of the presentation. So Catherine, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dora and Sebastian. And, uh, and hello to several of my friends and a relative or two who are online and to many of you whom I hope I'll have a chance to meet in the future. Uh, it's um, fun for me to be able to talk about this book. I spent seven years working on it, five years of research and a couple more pulling things together. And I'm going to share my screen and use slides to give you an overview. Okay, so as Dora said, the book is uh, Family Declassified and the subtitle is Uncovering My Grandfather's Journey from Spy to Children's Book Author. This is a picture of the cover. This is my website, katherinefennelly.com, and it has lots of information beyond what I'm going to talk about today. There's a biographical sketch of me. There are photographs of my grandfather and uh, some review, several reviews of the book and so forth. Uh, if you look for the, and, and then also how to purchase it, if you go to my website in the, in the future, uh, be sure you do not put a space between Catherine and Fenley. If you do, evidently some real estate company comes up, but if you leave the space out, it should be my website. So what I'm going to talk about today are why I did this research. What were my motives? And uh, just a little bit of what I found. I'll give you a chance to find the, uh, much more about that in, in the book itself. Uh, and sources and methods, because as Dora said, perhaps some of you are interested in doing similar kinds of research. My motives to research my grandfather, whose name was Francis Galnoy, uh, we all called him Ferco. Uh, and it's strange that I should be the one to write about him, because when I was growing up, all I knew about him was that he was an award-winning children's book author. This is a book for which he won something called the Newbery Medal, which is a, quite an important uh, prize in children's literature. He lived in Mexico when I was growing up, and so I rarely saw him. And my mother was estranged from her father. So we would get packages from him um, at Christmas time, actually. Uh, but I knew very little more about him. 
So my curiosity was awakened by a couple of things. One is that in 2015, I received a letter from the head of a research institute in Austria telling him he was writing a book about my grandfather's work as a spy in World War II for the Office of Strategic Services. I did not know he was a spy. And then three years after that, one of my daughters gave me a gift of 23andMe. And when I got the results back, I found that on my mother's side, I'm 98.4% Ashkenazi. I mean, that really surprised me because I grew up in an entirely secular household. Uh, my parents didn't attend religious services of any kind. My mother in particular was quite adamant saying, I'm a, an atheist. And she never talked about any religious beliefs or, or identity. And that meant that, of course, 98.4% Ashkenazi on the, on the Hungarian side meant that there wasn't just a Jewish uncle in our family tree. It meant that her her sister, of course, and her mother, her father, her grandparents, all of her aunts and uncles and cousins, all were Jews. And that really surprised me. So let me give you just a taste of who was Francis Kalnoy. He was born in what was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1899. His Hungarian name is Fedding. Uh, he, in the United States, went by Francis. In Argentina, went by Francisco. Um, so, as I say, we all called him Ferko as a diminutive. His mother was Rosa Margolit Kalnoy. And I was told, and, and it was family lore, that his mother had died when he was one year old. And one of the first lies that I found out about family secrets was that, in fact, Rosa did not die when uh, my grandfather was one. She was put into what was called an insane asylum, a psychiatric hospital, and she was there for about 20 years. So here you see her looking very young. This is with one of uh, my grandfather's older brothers, uh, and she was in her early 30s. After my grandmother was taken, or my great-grandmother was put into the psychiatric hospital, my great-grandfather, Josef Kalnoy, uh, took a mistress. I don't know if they were ever married, to be honest, but uh, she took on the role of stepmother. And in fact, my grandfather and two of his brothers listed her as if she were their mother in personnel documents that I've seen. Uh, and she was not. Uh, Ershabet uh, Svengali, and you see the cross around her neck. She was Catholic. And it may be at that point that the family began to pass as uh Catholic. My grandfather at age 15 was sent to a maritime academy in uh, what is now part of Croatia, the Royal Hungarian Maritime Academy. Uh, and then in World War I, you see him on the left here in his uh, naval uniform, but uh, his older brothers to the right uh, were all in military service for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And of course, that's the my um, great-grandfather, uh, uh, Josef uh, Kalnoy, uh, sitting there with his cute haircut there, <laughs> surrounded by his sons, his four sons. There were also daughters, uh, and I, I talk about them in the book. Um, this may be the last time that the brothers were, were all together. Then Ferko was in the Imperial Merchant Marines, and he came to the United States on a Hungarian ship with the Marines, um, and he... Uh, came at a time when it was before the restrictive immigration laws of the uh, 1924, for example, it was very restrictive, but he came in 1919 when in fact he was able to enter the United States legally and to remain. He, uh, one year later, he married my grandmother, Erspet Radkai, uh, everyone called her Elsie. She was 19, he was 20. And so I began to ask myself, how did a Jewish Hungarian immigrant from a war-torn country after World War I, Hungary was devastated, and I, I talk about that in the book, but there's not time to get into it right now. How did he become a high-level spy for the Allies in World War II? Well, I gave a talk on this actually about three weeks ago here in New York at the American uh, Jewish Historical Society. And my hypothesis is that it was my grandfather's work with something called the Foreign Language Information Service that prepared him for a career with the federal government. 
The FLIS, as it was called, uh, later became the Council for American Unity uh, and more recently the U.S. Committee on Refugees and Immigrants. It was, uh, he was an editorial advisor. He wasn't a full-time employee, I don't think, but uh, he worked off and on for almost 20 years with the FLIS, uh, reading foreign language newspapers, editorials, translating them, most likely from Hungarian, perhaps also from German um, to English. He, my grandfather spoke seven languages, so uh, he may also have translated uh, Croatian and uh, and so forth. Um, and then also what the uh, FLIS did was it, it received information from the U.S. government um, and it sent it to the editors of these uh, foreign language uh, periodicals in the United States. Um, it, when it began in World War I, the goal of the U.S. government in establishing this organization was to uh, let foreign-born immigrants know about the United States position in World War I and to support it. Uh, but then, of course, they continued on into uh, the, the 40s, and my grandfather was with them until 1941 when he joined the U.S. government. And the U.S. joined the war, uh, World War II, in 1941, and that was the year three weeks after Pearl Harbor that he began working in what was called the Oral Intelligence Office for the Coordinator of Information. And that was the precursor to the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS. And actually, the OSS is the precursor to today's CIA. So my grandfather was with the OSS. Here's a, a picture of him uh, in his OSS uniform. Uh, and he worked for the OSS for the span of U.S. involvement in World War II, from December 1941 until December 1945. By the summer of 1944, my grandfather was the head of a highly secretive organization called X2 for the Balkan region, Yugoslavia, Moldova, Bulgaria, Romania, Albania. And he also was involved in some military strategies in Hungary, Northern Italy, Turkey, and Greece. And as I said, X2 was a top secret branch of the OSS and their, their uh, mission was to obtain strategic information on what was happening in fascist Europe. So they recruited and they trained covert operators to sneak behind enemy lines. Uh, and they received, uh, for example, uh, man ship manifests from the Navy of all of the immigrants who had come into U.S. ports, particularly on the East Coast, uh, and then uh, were able to interview them. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. That was uh, when my grandfather was involved in creating and later directing what was called the Survey of Foreign Experts. So those ship manifests, as I say, were handed over to him and his employees. And let's say that you were in Vichy, France, and you uh, ran a perfume business. Well, you would most likely know about sourcing of chemicals in France, perhaps about transportation systems and export regulations. And you certainly may have seen what uh, were some of the encampments of the Nazis in uh, Vichy, France. So he created a database that cataloged human intangible assets for fascist governments in Europe and beyond. And in a pre-internet age, what other source was there really of this kind of strategic information? This is an evaluation of uh, many positive evaluations that I've read. And this was by the head of European uh, X2 operations at the time in which he said that on numerous occasions, Mr. Kalanay's careful piecing together of fragmentary evidence revealed facts about ABWAR, the, the uh, Nazi uh, secret service and the Reich security functioning in Central and Western Europe, which the activities of agents and controlled enemy agents in those regions had failed to uncover. So that, that's actually very high praise. So my grandfather was involved in recruiting and training and supervising resistance fighters in the heart of the Nazi occupied countries uh, and in uh, training for sabotage and propaganda, particularly in the Balkans and in Northern Italy and Hungary. Here's another evaluation. This was from the deputy director of the Office of Strategic Services for Psychological Warfare. 
Mr. K is doing currently one of the most intelligent organizational jobs in connection with his mission, which I have ever seen done in the annals of OSS. So I, I was really struck by these uh, documents. Now, if you know about the Nazi invasion of Hungary, it came at the very end of the war. It was in March of 1944 when Hitler invaded Hungary. And he did it in order to try to keep Hungary from defecting from the Third Reich, the way that bef just before that, Italy and Finland and Bulgaria and Romania had defected. And although the war was almost over in March of 1944, almost 600,000 Jews were murdered in Hungary in 12 months. That's close to 75% of the Jewish population of Hungary. I write about this in detail in the book. I'm not going to write about uh, a lot of it right now, but I, I talk about how Hungary went from what was known in the at the end of the 19th century as the golden age for Jews, where Jews were, at, particularly in Budapest, but around the country, they were predominantly the professional class of lawyers and doctors and engineers and so forth, um, who believed that they, they were often strongly nationalistic, Hungarian nationalism, and could not believe that what was going on as they began to understand what was going on in the war in Poland and in, in Nazi-occupied, other parts of Nazi-occupied Europe, could not believe it was going to happen in Hungary. So I, I talk about this. What is it that actually turned Budapest into something that uh, experts have called Holocaust City? Um, and how did it go from this golden age to, to that uh, terrible time? It happened so fast. In March was the German invasion. By April, all Hungarian Jews were required to wear yellow stars. 220,000 in Budapest were forced to move into 2,000 yellow star houses to facilitate their deportation. And by mid-May, 800,000 Hungarian Jews had been forced into ghettos or prison camps nationwide. So I said to myself, well, all right, my grandfather is in this very high and strategic position for intelligence in the region. What was happening to his mother, his sister, his nephew, who were in Budapest after the Nazi invasion when he had that key role? Well, you remember that picture of the very young mother I showed you? She, This is she uh, here uh, on the left, on my left. Um, and this is uh, Ferko's older sister, Borbala, called Boriska. Um, who took care of, of her mother after she was released from the psychiatric hospital after perhaps 20 years there. And here they are in Budapest in a nightmare during the war. This is a picture of women and children in Budapest in 1944 being marched, hands up. I don't know if they're being forced into Yellow Star houses or to the train station where they were then deported most likely to Auschwitz. And this is a picture of a yellow star house, like the house that my relatives lived in, in 1944. The irony, the very sad irony, is that they could have left uh, Hungary because they had a, a Raoul Wallenberg letter of protection called the Schutzpass um, in order to have safe passage. Uh, and I talk about Wallenberg and, and his role in, in my book. But Boriska's son, my, my grandfather's uh, uh, nephew was uh, a forced laborer up on the Austrian border laying rails in the winter of 1944. And his mother and grandmother did not want to leave Hungary while he was interned there. And I, I must say as a mother, I, I can understand that. In On December 2nd, 1944, Boriska was arrested in Budapest was taken to the air across the fascist headquarters and beaten to death. And one month later, her mother died of heart failure. Again, not, not surprising perhaps. And Boriska's son who was in the labor camp, Dennis, was shot there March 31st, 1945, three weeks before the Soviet army liberated that camp. This is a picture on the banks of the Danube of Hungarians who were shot there. Uh, at the again at the end of the war, and if you've been to Budapest, you will have seen perhaps this very moving memorial of bronzed shoes of people before they were thrown into the river. 
So what did Ferco do after the war? Well, he went to California uh, where he had a farm and a vineyard in Northern California. He built uh, bread ovens like this. Um, and then in the 19, early 1950s and 1953, he fled to Mexico. He was there for 20 years. And I learned, and some of what I believe was the reason for his flight to Mexico from a book that was written by a woman named Sylvia Press, who was both his assistant throughout the war in the OSS, but also his lover. And she wrote what was ostensibly fictional work, but it was so close to nonfiction that the CIA bought up all the copies at the time and wouldn't release it. Now, since then, it is possible, and I, I have a copy, it is possible to get it. But what she describes is her own interrogation. Uh, this is after my grandfather had left the OSS, but she stayed on and she was interrogated about her work for him and she was denied a pension. And it was because of his support of Tito, the Yugoslav communist leader in World War II. And I'll talk about a little bit more about that. This is a picture of Sylvia and a letter, I mean, a photograph she endorsed to my grandfather. During the Second World War, Yugoslavia had two main resistance movements. There were the Chetniks, headed by Drasa uh, Mikhailovich, excuse me, who supported the royalists. Uh, and then there was the communist leader, uh, Josip Broz, known as Tito. Well, the U.S. government and the Brits supported Tito because he was an effective, uh, and the parties, so they were effective anti-communists, uh, excuse me, anti-fascists. Uh, and they knew, of course, that he was a communist leader. But in the 50s, with what was called the McCarthy era in the United States, with the, the tremendous anti-communist fervor that anyone who had something to do with Tito, even if it was federal policy, was suspect. So I believe that is part of what promoted my grandfather's move to Mexico in 1953. Now, while he was there, he lived in a beautiful town called Valle de Bravo. It's a, now it's kind of a resort town, 94 miles southwest of Mexico City. And he wrote children's books. He wrote articles about cooking, published several in House Beautiful magazine, and he designed homes. His two brothers, Andres and Jorge, who stayed in Argentina, were renowned architects. They were trained as architects. Ferco was not, but he spent a lot of time in Argentina. My mother was actually born there um, before going back to Hungary uh, with her family. And um, so he clearly learned something from his brothers. These are three of the children's books or the three books that he wrote while he was in Mexico. This is one of his uh, articles for House Beautiful magazine about cooking. And this is a picture of one of 25 houses that he designed in Valle de Bravo, beautiful places. Then in 1974, when he was 75 years old, he came back to the United States. He moved to the US, he lived in Carmel. Uh, he always lived in beautiful places. He never spoke about our Jewish ancestry. He rarely talked about his time in the OSS. That's perhaps not surprising. He was sworn to secrecy as were all of the OSS members, but he never spoke of the Holocaust in Hungary. He never talked about our Jewish heritage, the death of his sister, his nephew. And only at the very end of his life did he acknowledge our Jewish heritage to my cousin in California when he was age 93. Now that, those kinds of secrets are not uncommon, as I'm sure you know. These are just a few of many, many people who didn't know about their Jewish heritage or didn't know about the history of their families, uh, tragedies in the Holocaust. There's the diplomat Richard Holbrook, whose family was of Czech uh, descent, Madeline, uh, excuse me, uh, German, I believe, uh, Madeline Albright, whose family was Czech descent. And she says, I don't think she, she was a fifth, in her early 50s when she says that she learned that three of her Czech grandparents were killed in the Holocaust. There's Tom Stoppard, um, who was of Czech descent, and uh, again, uh, many secrets. And then there are authors like Jonathan Safran Floyer, uh, Nicole Krauss, Julie Orange, and many others. And it actually, not just Jews, but post-trauma uh, after things like the Armenian Genocide or after uh, emancipation of slaves uh, in the United States, many people refused to talk about what they had endured for a variety of reasons. And a good portion of my book is actually about that and about 
family secrets, what motivates them, and what are the impacts on family members. Ferco died on December 2nd, 1992, on the 48th anniversary of his sister's murder at the Aerocross headquarters. This is a watercolor uh, painted in California when he was in his 80s. So I'll tell you a little bit about how I undertook this research. Um, I began talking to family members, one of whom is on the call today, Esteban Canoy. Uh, welcome, Esteban, who's, who lives in Spain, grew up in Argentina, is a, an architect, as were his was his father and his uncle in Argentina. Uh, he's a self-appointed family historian, and I learned so much from Esteban. Uh, he has many documents about our family, many of the photographs that I've used in the book and on my website came from him. Uh, I talked to some other family members in California and Maryland who had known my grandfather when he when they were alive or when he was alive. Uh, I got government documents from the National Archives. Uh, I did a Freedom of Information Act requests for his uh, records from the OSS. The CIA took over this, the OSS records. So I did a FOIA request to the uh, CIA, got his immigration record, ship manifest. I read hundreds of books and articles, uh, went through newspaper archives. And I hope you know, if you're doing your own research, that there are some wonderful Jewish research sites. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum has a searchable site with just thousands and thousands of documents. Jewish Gen has uh, a website and, an, and a newsletter with all kinds of tips for doing this kind of research. I went to social media as the granddaughter of someone uh, in the Office of Strategic Services. I was able to uh, join the OSS Society and pose questions to their platform. Um, and History Hub, I'll talk about in a minute, is a National Archives uh, free source that's very useful. And then I wrote to other academics, people who had expertise in areas that I knew nothing about, uh, Some of one of which I'd never heard of. I didn't know there was a field called onomastics, which is the study of name changes. If you're looking at Jewish history in particular, that's a fascinating uh, way to look at what was going on. My family, for example, the colonists changed their name and the spelling of their names a few times. And I talk about what motivated that uh, in the book. I looked into psychiatric hospitals in the Austro-Hungarian Empire by corresponding with specialists in that, military historians, specialists on the two wars, Mexican sources, and so forth. So let me tell you about going to the National Archives, which is where I, I got my grandfather's declassified OSS files. This is an example of a record group. This is record group 226, which is just a list. You don't have to read anything on here, but it's a list of many of the reports that were in this particular record group. The one that I was interested in that day was 249 records relating to the survey of foreign experts, uh, which I, I mentioned to you earlier. And then at the National Archives, at the College Park office, you fill out a, a slip just the way we used to do in libraries, right, before uh, digitization where uh, or automation, we would fill out what we wanted, what boxes, and then archivists there go to the paper records. They've digitized many records, but many of them are still in paper form on onion skin and originals. So you have to you know get some clearance before you go into the National Archives and handle these things very carefully. And then they bring you on a corral. They'll bring you the box of uh, boxes of documents that you're interested in, as they did here. And this is the reading room. So I sat for many hours in this reading room. Unfortunately, you're allowed to take photographs. So I used my phone and took photos of hundreds of documents. And then I, this is an example of one of the hundreds of documents or more. It used to be secret. Now it's declassified. And so I, I took photos of it. And the way I organized it, oh, well, before I get into that, I'll, this is just an overview of the kinds of documents I was getting. So there were secret intelligence memos and reports, X2 memos and reports, and also something called special operations. And then there were uh, reports from the various offices that my grandfather uh, worked from in Italy in particular, in Bari and Caserta, also a little bit in Istanbul, London. Um, and then there were there were many reports on conditions in Nazi occupied countries and internal correspondence uh, on regional and country issues. So uh, this is not something that I used that NARA has, but this is of 
interest to some of you who are looking at Jewish genealogy, the National Archives has many sets of documents, uh, maps and texts and photographs related to the Holocaust, including evidence that was gathered for the Nuremberg trials uh, and other uh, and reports on, on the uh, Nazi concentration camps. And so you can access those from the National Archives. In order to make some sense out of all of these documents, I use two research tools in particular. One is called Scrivener. It's a database that is for organizing writing projects. So you could use it to write a thesis or fiction or nonfiction or any, any sort of uh, writing project. And you can separate your research notes from the notes that are part of the manuscript. Um, and then they have a way that you can also write a synopsis of your uh, pages of notes that you're interested in and sort those. So you can easily move around chapters, uh, you can develop character lists, and you can then with the press of a button, you can compile this to a manuscript with the uh, uh, specifications that you set up. <coughs> Excuse me. You can work with a split screen. You can set goals and track progress. I, uh, progress. There's a steep learning curve, but if you have a lot of data and a complicated project, yeah, I found it very worthwhile. So here's a screenshot <clears throat> from one of my Scrivener files. On the left, and you, again, you don't have to read this. I'm just describing how it works. Um, these are headings of some of the, the uh, categories that I had in Scrivener, Secrets About the Holocaust, uh, the book Shanda, uh, a book outline for my book, etc. <clears throat> this particular document that's uh, highlighted here was a letter from a supervisor of my grandfather. Uh, and here's my synopsis of that letter, which was a pos very positive evaluation of my grandfather's work. And then that synopsis that I wrote can be, you can look at a different view instead of looking at the document view we just saw. You can look at this, uh, it's it's like old fashioned note cards, like three by five note cards. Remember the, I don't know if you did this, but in the olden days, I used those for my writing projects or sort cards. It, when I did my dissertation, that's the way I organized my notes. And now you can do it on a computer <clears throat> and you can sort these synopses any way you like. So, uh, and when you do, you can simultaneously then change the order of the chapters and so forth. And then there's another uh, software program that I found useful because I had so many timelines that I was looking at. What was happening during World War II? What was the US doing? What was happening in Central Europe during World War II? What was happening in my grandfather's life in New York when he first arrived and later? And, what was happening to my mother and just so many things. And so what you can do with the end timeline is you can connect events to, you can sort by people, places, and relationships. Uh, it doesn't work for a family tree, but here's a screenshot of my end timeline. Uh, and this is showing you um, different events in my grandfather's life. And up here, it's color coded. So anything green here was my grandfather, anything red was my grandmother. This is Sylvia Press, you remember the his lover and, and who wrote the book I described and so forth. This is Angleton, who was a prominent <clears throat> OSS officer, later a director of the CIA and so forth. And here are places, um, Hungary, Europe, USA, Buenos Aires, the Middle East, Africa, and so forth. And I can search any way I like on either the dates or the individuals or the places. So I, I found it useful. You can actually import some of this into Scrivener too. And then I told you I'd mention History Hub because it's such a cool uh, free resource. The National Archives sponsors this and it's a free crowdsourced research platform. And the way it works is that you pose a question on History Hub and either citizen archivists or paid uh, National Archives staff and some other agencies answer this question. So here's a question that I posed to History Hub. I said, I've read a copy of a memo from someone called James R. Murphy, Murphy, who was head of counterintelligence X2 branch during World War II. And it came from what is clearly a code name, Puritan. And in the memo, Puritan refers to another code name, Jester. Can anyone help me identify these two individuals? And here's the answer I got back. 
we search the code name index, the personal name index, the records of the OSS, which are not available online. And we located six references to Jester or Puritan and six references to James Murphy that may be relevant to your research. Whoops. So very useful. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples that are not from my research, but show you how people who are doing their own family genealogy can use History Hub. Here's somebody who wrote and said, are there any records for Mary Durko coming to America between 1890 and 1922? I have no information other than her sisters. Um, and they, they said, well, you have to provide some basic information, her birth or death year, uh, where she lived and so forth. Is Durko her maiden name? So this person did, and then, they responded, this was a volunteer genealogy assistant at NARA saying, I believe these are the correct passenger departure and arrival lists from Mary and Pauline Durko. Uh, so it's very cool. Here's another example. Somebody said, um, I'm trying to find birth records for my second great grandmother, Carrie Williams, a maiden named Palermo, born 1884 and so forth, and her husband. And they responded with an index to Catholic baptisms in which they found the name of one of the people she's interested in. Um, and they also showed a ship arrival uh, in New York, 1879, that had pass a passenger list that included them. So uh, I'm a big fan, as you can see, of history. Um, <clears throat> well, there are a bunch of things I will never know. One is why my grandfather abruptly left the Office of Strategic Services at the end of the war when he had just received a new assignment. There's also a possibility that he didn't leave, but that his new assignment was totally classified. And I go and I talk about that a little bit in the book. But I sent a letter to the FBI and I said, was he ever under investigation? Well, this is a classic non-denial, non-confirmation Politico speak. This, they said, the mere acknowledgement of the existence or non-existence of such records is itself a classified fact, protected by FOIA exemption, blah, blah, blah. Um, and at the end, they say, this is a standard response and should not be read to indicate that any such records do or do not exist. So, no thank you. <laughs> Another question is why my grandfather and so many of our relatives kept our Jewish heritage secret. And this is a major topic in my book because it, it's one I've struggled with. Um, other topics in the book, uh, there, there are many, and I'll just uh, tell you, I won't tell you about them, but I'll just tell you that we, I talk about what it was like when my grandfather arrived in the United States in the early 1900s. What was uh, like for an immigrant from Central Europe? What did he do early uh, in his life in New York and New Jersey? He was uh, a journalist. He associated with artists and socialists. He was a follower of a mystic called Gurdjieff. He and another uh, associate who actually wrote, was an artist who designed about 25 covers for the New Yorker magazine, um, Julian Demiski, uh, they opened a nudist camp for artists and socialists in upstate New York. <laughs> My, the only thing I ever heard about that when I was growing up was my mother talking about how horrendously embarrassing it was that her father ran a nudist camp in New York State. Um, and actually some famous artists and authors went to that camp. And I have, uh, for example, uh, uh, there's a chapter in a book by um, Theodore Dreiser's lover, the, the author who went to the camp where she talks about my grandfather and his partner. Uh, again, psychiatric hospitals. Uh, I really looked at how Budapest, Budapest became a Holocaust city and why the Holocaust was so devastating in Hungary in general. Talk about my grandfather's abandonment of his first wife and his second wife um, and his children. Uh, he was a war hero. He was a remarkable man. He was not a good father. He was a complicated man. Uh, a lot of details of his life as a spy. I talk about anti-Semitism in the U.S. government, uh, both broadly during World War II and then within the OSS, there was some, uh, and his work in Mexico, uh, and a detailed analysis of his children's books by my, my political science uh, cousin, Wendy Brown, um, and finally, again, why people keep family secrets. So let me read just a, a couple of paragraphs here from the book to give you a flavor if you haven't read it. 
This is a heading, Generations of Silence. What accounts for the silence of my grandfather and his family regarding the deaths of their close family members? I've come to learn that such silence is common among Jews around the world and other victims of large-scale trauma. But in my grandfather's case, anti-Semitism in Hungary surely played a role uh, in suppressing our Jewish ancestry. And our family was also influenced by close ties to heavily Catholic Argentina, where Ferco's brothers resided and where my mother was born and lived for a few years. But even more than the silence of my grandfather um, and that of our Argentine relatives, it was the silence of my mother and my grandmother that troubles me the most because I knew them intimately. I didn't know my grandfather well. How much of our family history did my mother know beyond her Jewish ancestry? Did she discuss the past with her mother, Elsie? Did she ever reveal details to my father? Did she have nightmares about what would have happened to the family had she and Elsie and Petty not fled Hungary in 1933 when my grandfather stranded them there? I will never know the answer to these questions, but I'm saddened by my own lack of curiosity about our history until it was too late to talk to my mother or grandmother about their experiences. Before writing this book, if you had asked me what it meant to be half Hungarian, I would have given you examples so superficial and positive, they might have been conjured by a director of tourism. I think of my grandmother Elsie's love of Hungarian music and how she would get up to dance the chardash when we took her to a Hungarian restaurant in New York to celebrate her birthday. I think of Ferko's soft Hungarian accent cultivated and maintained after almost three quarters of a century in North and South America. I think of my mother's delectable stuffed cabbage leaves and homemade pastries. And I remember her pleasure when a Yorkville shopkeeper said in Hungarian, kiss it, Chocolok, I kiss your hand as she left his shop laden with cans of paprika and caraway seeds and smoked sausages. I understand now that these colorful images mask the horrors my family members lived through in the 1930s and 40s. And in fact, not a day goes by that I don't think about their fates and my own Hungarian heritage. So what's next? Well. I have something positive and I'm so pleased that just in the past three months, uh, with the help of my cousin, my second cousin, Esteban, who again is on this call, uh, to have learned about my great aunt Boriska, the one who was murdered, that she was an artist, a wonderful uh, painter and a maker of uh, engravings for book plates, ex libris, in the 19, late 1920s and early 1930s. And not only did I learn this, but I was able to acquire a beautiful oil painting that she did in 1933. And here I am when it just arrived from a gallery in Budapest. Uh, I was so pleased to receive it. So I have uh, begun research on her life. And if you have suggestions regarding some of this, um, please let me know. You can contact me if you go to my website, uh, katherinefenley.com. My email is in there and so forth. I'm trying to discover what art my great aunt Boriska, uh, what painting she did. I There's beyond Google. Of course, I've done Google searches and there is someone in Hungary who's trying to help me look into this as well. But I'm trying to find the the where her paintings are. And if I could, I'd, I'd love to purchase some. I do have two book plates of hers that I was able to purchase. Um, but I know she she had several um, showings in galleries, uh, and she studied in Italy and in Munich for a time. And she had a, a gallery presentation in Buenos Aires, where her two uh, brothers were. So I would just love to learn more about her. And that, I believe, will be my next book. Uh, and then uh, I've had people say to me that it would be great to translate family declassified into Spanish that some of our Argentine relatives, perhaps some in Spain and other places would like to read it, uh, possibly in German and Hungarian. And I, my publisher, uh, Sunbury Press is very small and they're not able to help me with things like uh, translation. They said, well, if you find a company that wants to translate it, you know, that's good. So if you have any ideas, that would be great. And then the other thing people have said to me is that, uh, it would be that this story is very cinematic. My grandfather's life was 
was very cinematic. And I'd love to think about a way to make a film about him or make a film about family declassified. That's easier said than done. But if you know anybody who might be interested in that, please let me know. <laughs> so once again, this is my website and thank you very much for your attention. And I would uh, be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you for sharing with us uh, your book and your research. And thank you, of course, everyone for being here today. Tomorrow we will send out an email with, uh, with the recording of this talk, with Catherine's um, website, with, where you can buy the book and some further information. So we will, you will receive all this from us tomorrow. Um, and there was a question, um, Catherine, um, how, how does one access the History Hub? Oh, just go online and, and uh, type in History Hub, it'll come up. And if your book is in sale in Israel? Um, it's, be bought in Israel. it's available in Europe and it's on Amazon. So um, I think via Amazon one could get it in Israel, but I haven't spoken to anyone in Israel who has ordered it that way. Um, and now I see Varda, if you want to share your comment, just because it's long. So if uh, you want to share in your own words, please feel free to, to unmute. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. I had the um, the headset on. Um, my professor in uh, New Mexico at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, her name was Vera John Steiner, and she was a very, very wonderful professor from Hungary. She had escaped when she was about 15 years old. And there's a, uh, she's no longer alive, but there's a lot of work on of her, uh, a lot of information about her work on creativity and education and linguistics and psychology. Um, her daughter, Suki John, is a dancer who teaches in a university in Texas. Um, I think it's Texas Christian University. And Suki made a dance drama, um, ex um, which is close to an hour long when I saw the performance about the history of her family, the escape from Hungary, what the family was like before and during. So it's a dance drama of, of the Holocaust and it's called Shema. And in the comment, I put a link um, to the to what's on YouTube, that it, it's a shorter version of the Shema on YouTube, um, and I'll also say briefly that I I was going to about to add this other comment, Isaac um, Artenstein is not. Um, are you hearing me? Yes. Um, yes, we can hear you. Isaac Artenstein is a filmmaker from Mexico, and um, he's done a documentary about the Jews of New Mexico, and he has a Facebook page, and he'd be an interesting person to um, be in contact with. So just through Facebook, um, uh, you could probably, you can find him. So Thanks. I'll pause there and hope that you heard me. Yes, yes, we do. Thank you so much, Varda. And you actually reminded me that I've just written an article in Schmott in the, the journal that uh, is uh, coming out or has come out, I think, uh, about this book. <laughs> so you can also share it with us, Catherine, and we can send it tomorrow in, in the follow-up email. On my website, I have uh, oh, something okay. here. I, it's a very elaborate website. I have a okay. daughter who helped me set it up. She's got, she's into that. Okay. And uh, Raul shared in the comments that you can contact him for uh, Hungarian artsy content, context okay. that he thinks they might be able to help. And he put his email in the chat. So you're welcome to uh, get it from there. Thank you, Raul. Um, so a question from Sherry, is there a timeline for any documents you were not allowed to obtain to be declassified in the future? 
Well, if there is, the the CIA hasn't told me. <laughs> they they um well, I, I should I mean there are batches, large batches of documents that are declassified, but they don't tell you that it will be such and such a document. So I think what one has to do is just to go back and look. And uh you can when you go to the National Archives, you can sometimes find that out. There are others that are so highly classified that it's they were destroyed uh and it's impossible to know thank you uh i see now just some comments i don't see no more questions but if anyone has questions please feel free to to raise your hand or put them in the in the chat but i do see some comments people congratulating you on on your work and on the presentation and also uh, I see some people shared more information about Isaac uh, Artenstein, so uh, you can also find, if anyone else is interested, um, you can find uh, information about him here. And while I'm giving another minute for people to, to write questions or raise hands, I just hey, want to... Good evening, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Sydney Yeager. I'm the public programs producer here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I am... Uh, you, hello, now we lost you. Okay, so I while, while we wait for uh, Christina to come back, uh, I, I see that some more questions came in. Um, so Andy's asking, are you taking any interest in your Jewish religion? You know, people ask me that. Um, because I had such a secular background, I, I, I don't identify strongly with religious sides of Judaism, but I identify very strongly with, with Jewish values. And I, I think actually that predates this work, but it's become strengthened. Um, welcoming the stranger, um, trying acts of kindness. Uh, I, I do, I spend quite a bit of time actually working with a local uh, synagogue here, uh, Congregation Beth Elohim and, and a refugee task force that's come out of it. And so I identify with the values more than with perhaps the religiosity. Thank you. And a question from Anne, did your mother know that she was Jewish? I'm certain that she did from what I looked at and, and the fact that she went back to Hungary at one point. She, uh, I'm certain that she knew it. I don't know, I will never know all of the detail, how much detail she had about what happened to our relatives, but it's hard for me to believe that she didn't know that her uh, her grandmother, or rather her, her aunt was murdered and her cousin and so forth. It's, uh, I believe she must have known that, but just never. And that perhaps that's why she was so firm when, when we asked her questions, she didn't want to talk about it. Uh, thank you. Can you share the name of the place or any more about where your grandfather was with artists, mystics, etc., or those involved in uh, Gurdjieff, if I'm not uh, pronouncing it wrong, work? Um, yeah. Well, there are two different things. So the, the artist camp that he and Julian Domiski established was in Brewster, New York. And I have a section about that in the book. And his he followed Gurdjieff, I think, much of his adult life. And actually, some of his artist friends in New York were Gurdjieff followers, too. So both New York State and then when he was in California, I know he was involved with the Gurdjieff Society there. Thank you. Um, so while I'll give one more minute to, to see if there are more questions, I'll just let you know about this week's uh, cashier program. So this Thursday, we will have a talk about the Jews of Algeria. And on Sunday, we will have a talk about the Jews of Suriname. So they're both uh, quite exotic and very, very interesting, very different stories from their neighbors and from other uh, Jewish um, communities in, in, in the region. So in, in case of Algeria, it's very different from other 
North African countries and Suriname is very different from other South American countries. So if they're going to be very, very exciting, we hope um, some of you can join us. And I don't see no more questions. I saw that a lot. Okay, one, one more came in, so I will read this. Um, or it's more of a comment. The book is a rare combination of thorough scholarly work, a thriller, World War II history, and the character that screams being the protagonist of a film, all written in a very engaging style. So I guess this is someone who already read the book, <laughs> sharing uh, her thoughts. And uh, yes? No, I just said thank you. That was very kind. <laughs> And another question, did he ever meet or have contact with the Russian painter Nicolas Sururi, who was also involved in peace work in, in the 19, in 1920s onward? Not that I know of. Thank you. Is it possible to order the book through Kindle platform? Yes, on my website. You can get it Amazon, Kindle, you can get it from uh, bookstores, uh, and they're telling me, my publisher tells me there will be an audio version, but actually now that you remind me, I have to get back to him and say, when is that coming out? <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Sally's asking, why were you interested in Shanda book? Um, oh, I'm just reading very broadly about Jewish histories and memoir. And uh, um, so that's why. You know, uh, and actually, when you mentioned your next Kesher program, uh, I, I'm thinking about the Middle East. I, I'm reading right now a book by Jordan Salama about his Argentine Jewish relatives who were from Syria, but ended in, up in Argentina. Very interesting book. So I, I recommend that. We actually hosted him also on a, on a Kesher book club in, in March. So We're, okay. we're both part of uh, the Jewish uh, Book uh, Council Network. So if anyone wants to see his uh, his talk about uh, uh, his book, then it's on our on our website. Um, so a lot of people have been commenting how amazing this uh, talk was, and they are looking forward to reading your book. So hopefully many people will get the chance to read it. Again, we will uh, share tomorrow the information, but also you can go directly now to Catherine's uh, website that she already shared with us. So thank you so much again, Catherine, for, for presenting to us. And thank you everyone for being here and, and, and participating in this talk. And you will hear from us tomorrow with all the information that I mentioned earlier. Thank you very much to everyone. Can you send you'll send me the chat comments or uh can you Yes, no problem. We can we can send them to you. Great. Yes. Uh so thank you so much, everyone, and we, we wish you a wonderful rest of the day. And thank you, Catherine. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye, bye everyone. Bye-bye. Hi, Dora. Hello. Hope you're well. Hi, hi, Carol. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Love it. Okay, leave. Yeah.